Okay. Um, okay. Thank you so much for having me here and also for sticking around uh, for this talk. So um, I'm Julian. I'm from uh, the Looking Group at Harvard, and I will tell you a little bit about some of the experiments that we did recently and what I think is um, that I think are particularly interesting for the future of what we can do with neutral atoms in the field of quantum science. So uh, I just want to start with a quick introduction. Um, also inspired by some conversations that I had yesterday, because I think uh, there are two key challenges when we talk about uh, quantum science, and sometimes we forget one of the two. So of course, the, the first thing is that we need to be able to build large-scale quantum machines. Uh, and in that sense, we have two main goals. We, we want to be able to control our quantum degree of, degrees of freedom with high fidelities, and also we would like to be able to scale to large sizes such that we can do something useful with it. But also, we are still trying to develop new algorithms and science applications that can be uh, implemented on these platforms. And, and sometimes I feel like we forget that we have very few interesting applications that are known so far. And I feel like I'm an experimentalist, so I'm trying to mainly answer the first question. But we always have our eyes also on the second aspect. What are the, the interesting things that we can work towards? So, uh, as you know, there are several platforms that are currently being used to, uh, to, uh, to get to a good quantum computer. And as you know from my title, the approach that we are following in our lab at Harvard is to use, to build this quantum computer starting from individual neutral atoms that are trapped in optical tweezers. Now, among the many interesting properties of neutral atoms, I think one of the, of the aspects that make this platform particularly interesting in this field is the great potential for scalability. We're already at the level of a few hundred atoms that we can control coherently to do, to do quantum anybody physics. Uh, but we, we think we have an idea on how to scale to a few thousands, uh, let's say, in a year or two. And we'll see how it goes after that. So I just wanted to mention these are the main results that uh, we published over the past year and a half. I chose to talk about these two because I believe these were kind of the most surprising results of the past year. And in a sense, they also uh, opened up new directions for the future. But I wanted to mention the other as well, because if you're interested, we can talk in the breaks afterwards. Um, so you've heard a bit about topological spin liquids yesterday from Marcello. So now you're biased and you think that my results are wrong. But I will, <laughs> I will try to. <laughs> I'm, joy I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. No, I think it's actually an interesting conversation. So. Uh, I will show what we did, and I think it, it's, it's important that we keep discussing how we can make these results more and more robust. And the second experiment, I will be a bit quicker on this, but I think this is one of the best things we did recently, uh, where we really uh, introduced a new, a new tool to our platform where we can uh, transport entanglement coherently through our system and achieve non-local connectivity, which gives us uh, a very interesting tool for many um, different applications. So I will start with an introduction on the platform. There are many theorists in the audience, so I will give you the, the main ingredients, and then I will dive into the, the two experiments that I just mentioned. So what does the platform look like? We uh, start with a two-dimensional array of optical tweezers. These tweezers are simply these tightly focused laser beams that you, you can use to trap single atoms. Uh, and we create this using a spatial line modulator, which allows us to create this intensity pattern with arbitrary geometries, which is very nice. You just click a button and you have a different uh, lattice. And we shine these optical tweezers at the center of a vacuum chamber. Here we have a cold cloud of rubidium atoms. So when we shine the tweezers, we start loading the atoms into the tweezers. And here you see that we have about 50% of the, of the traps that are randomly loaded with a single atom, and the other 50% is empty. So this is nice, but of course, if you want to do something useful with this, you would like to have a defect-free array. So the question is, can we deterministically fill a subset of traps, for example, the, the half here on the left? So to do that, we add a second set of tweezers. This time, these are movable in the 2D plane and they're generated using these acoustic optical deflectors. So the way we use uh, this is the following. We shine one of these tweezers onto one of the atoms that we trapped in this region that we're not interested in. And then we drag this optical tweezer 
to move the atom and drop it off at a final position that we actually want to be filled. So we can do this in parallel over many atoms at the same time. And so after this sorting procedure, you see that we get an almost defect-free array here on the right, in the right picture. And here I'm showing you a few different experimental repetitions just to show you how this works on average. And what we have here is uh, we have about 99% filling of the target traps, which means that if you wait long enough, you will always get, will, you will also get a, a, a perfect defect-free array. So the nice thing about this procedure is that it's very flexible, and so you can uh, arrange the atoms into different geometries, and here I'm showing you a few examples that we've used so far, and the thing that we always show to showcase these abilities, uh, this atomic Mario that is, uh, so each uh, dot creating the Mario is, is an atom. Okay, so the first uh, ingredient of this uh, experiment is the capability of creating these two-dimensional arrays of neutral atoms with programmable geometries. And you can imagine that this programmability is very nice because depending on the type of physics that you want to study, you can really uh, change the geometry very easily. And we have about, we have a few hundred atoms right now. Now the thing is that these atoms are a few microns away from each other, so they don't naturally interact. So how uh, do we make them interact? So we start with uh, the atoms in, a, in an electronic ground state, and then we use an optical transition to excite them from the ground to the Rydberg state. A Rydberg state is simply this highly excited electronic state, so you have this valence electron that is promoted to, to this high orbital, so the effective size of the atom is much larger than its original size in the ground state. And when the atoms are in this state, they interact with each other through strong Van der Waals interaction. They now have this dipole moment, and so they have this one over R to the six uh, interaction. So now if we consider a pair of atoms at a certain <laughs> distance R, if this distance is, is large enough, uh, and you have this optical transition, you can excite one or both of them to the Rydberg state. But now if you put the atom closer to each other, uh, the energy of the double excited state is shifting up because you have to, to take into account these strong Van der Waals interactions. So what happens here is that you can no longer excite both atoms to the Rydberg state because this excitation is no longer energetically allowed. So this is the famous Rydberg blockade mechanism. It simply tells you that within a certain distance you, have, you can have at maximum one excitation. And this characteristic distance is provided by the so-called blockade radius. Okay, so with this we have the second ingredient. Uh, we have these programmable arrays and we can engineer strong interactions by exciting the atoms to, to a Rydberg state. Now I want to show you a quick example of how uh, these simple ingredients can be used to study some interesting many-body uh, physics. And so the simplest example that we can think of in 2D is to have the atoms on a square lattice. So what we do here is we shine all the atoms with lasers that couple the ground to the Rydberg state. And so the many-body Hamiltonian that describes the system is the following. You have a drive term where sigma x is the operator that excites g to r, and omega is the Rabi frequency of the transition. You have the tuning term, and i is the occupation of uh, the Rydberg state at the side i of the lattice, and delta is the tuning from the Rydberg state, and finally you have these Van der Waals interactions. So if we are in the situation where this is the blockade radius, so if you have an excitation here in the center to the Rydberg state, it's four nearest neighbors are all blockaded that cannot be excited at the same time. You can ask, you can ask yourself, what is the many-body ground state of this system if we have a positive detuning here? So we are in this situation that is depicted in this, in this drawing. So given this Hamiltonian, since this term is negative, you will like to maximize, you minimize the energy by maximizing the number of atoms in the Rydberg state, but you have this constraint that comes from the blockade. And so in this, um, in this situation, the ground state corresponds to uh, this state where half of the atoms are excited and they form this checkerboard pattern. So here the red circles correspond to Rydberg atoms. So if you map the ground and the Rydberg state to spin up and down of a spin one half degree of freedom, these correspond to an antiferromagnetic state where you have the neighboring spins are anti-aligned. Okay, so this is just a simple example 
to show you how these very simple ingredients, I believe, uh, can really allow us to generate non-trivial quantum antibody phases. But now, given this uh, premise, we want to see how we can use these same tools to study more interesting uh, antibody phases. So you've heard quite a lot about spin liquids, but let me assume that there is someone in the audience that knows about spin liquids less than I do. And let me give one, a one slide introduction. So the spin liquid phase is something that was predicted uh, with first work in the 70s by Anderson. And uh, the system he was considering there was a system of spin one half particles, again, with antiferromagnetic interactions on a frustrated lattice this time. So an example is the triangular lattice, you have frustration because you don't know how to align uh, neighboring spins. And Anderson's idea was that one possible solution is that the spins can form these entangled pairs, also called dimers, where the state of the pair is a superposition of up, down, and down, up. So the spins don't choose a specific orientation, but they stay in these uh, entangled states. So all the spins in the, in the lattice would form these pairs, and you can immediately see that there is not a unique solution for the pairings. There are many possible ways in which the spin can pair up with their neighbors. There are exponentially many ways. So uh, Anderson's proposal was that the many body ground state would be the coherent macroscopic superposition of all the possible dimer coverings of the lattice. And this is what he called a resonating Wallenbond state that you've heard about a few times in these days. Okay, so this, this was the proposal. Uh, initially, nobody really cared too much about this. But in the following years, uh, it turns out that uh, this phase is actually very interesting because it displays a, an impressive number of very exotic properties. So as I mentioned, there is no spatial ordering of the spins. You see that they, they don't create a solid-like um, spatial order, but there is this sort of hidden topological order uh, the, the state has long range quantum entanglement throughout the entire system. The type of excitations that you have here have these peculiar anionic statistics. And among the many things I want to mention, one of the reasons why a lot of people got very excited about these topological phases is the potential application to realize robust quantum computing. And the most famous example in this sense is the Tori code model proposed by Kitayev. So for all these many, many reasons, people have been trying to see this uh, spin liquid phase in experiments. But it turns out to be very challenging for a number of reasons that I won't discuss here. But the, the bottom line is that there, there has been no, let's say, non-controversial experimental observation of this phase in condensed matter systems. So what happened a couple of years ago is that a few smart uh, theorists at Harvard started to ask themselves, can we realize this quantum spin liquid phase using Rydberg atoms? And the model that specifically Ruben came up with is the following. We have the atoms, so we need to choose a frustrated lattice, and in particular the one he chose is this lattice uh, where you have the atoms on the bonds of a Kagome lattice. I learned from Alicia that it, this would be uh, so the line graph of this would be a, a so-called ruby lattice, uh, but that doesn't, doesn't matter too much here. So you, the, the important thing is that the atoms are on the bonds of the Kagome lattice and not the vertices. And then you want to have a specific type of interactions, and in particular you want to have a, a blockade radius that looks like this. If you have an excitation to the Rydberg state here, its six nearest neighbors are all blockaded. And this gives you a specific constraint on the density of excitations that you can have in the system for which the maximum density can be one-fourth. The, the maximum density is one-fourth. Uh, why it's one-fourth? You can see it. You see around each vertex, you have four atoms. Out of the four atoms, only one can be excited at a time. Now, this constraint on the density allows us to map this system onto the dimer model of the Kagome lattice where the idea is that each atom in the Rydberg state corresponds to a dimer that connects the two adjacent vertices of the Kagome lattice. And the idea of the modeling, is, of, of the mapping is very simple. The constraints that you have on the Rydberg excitations are exactly the same constraints that you have if you put dimers on the Kagome lattice. Mainly, the fact that the, density, the maximum density is one-fourth means that two dimers cannot touch each other. 
each single vertex of the cargo lattice can belong at maximum to one dimer. So this is a nice uh, mapping for many reasons, but one of these reasons was that uh, it is known in the literature that uh, dimer models on cargo lattices have spin liquid phases. And so this was the beginning of this story. They were like, oh, maybe there's something here. And when they did the simulations, they indeed found out that there is a quantum spin liquid state in a certain range of parameters where you observe the spin liquid state, again, uh, that remembers us of the, of the proposals from Anderson, where the spin liquid state is the superposition of all the possible dimer coverings of the lattice. So what we do in the experiment is very similar to what I showed you before for the square lattice. We shine all the atoms with these homogeneous uh, beams that couple the ground to the Rydberg state. We do some state preparation that I will show you in a second, and then we look at the final state. And here I'm marking all the Rydberg, all the atoms in the Rydberg state with these red dimers according to the mapping that I just introduced. And you can see that we have a pretty nice dimer covering. And a perfect dimer covering means that we have exactly one fourth density, and so each vertex should be touched by exactly one dimer. And here you see this is pretty nice. We have only a few defects here and there. And, but this is, of course, not enough to say this is a spin liquid. Let's see what we need to do to uh, do the preparation and verify that this is a spin liquid. So the first thing that I think is interesting is how do we prepare this phase? So we try to do a quasi diabatic state preparation, which means that we slowly turn on omega, so we slowly turn on the lasers, but we initially start with the negative detuning. So we are in this situation. If you have a, neg a large negative detuning, it means that you're not, you don't have enough energy to excite anything to the Rydberg state. So the ground state of this Hamiltonian will be the state where every everything is in the ground state. But then what we do is to slowly change the detuning from negative to positive values, such that the system follows in the ground state. At each time, the system stays in the ground state of the instantaneous Hamiltonian. And so what we hope to do is to connect the initial trivial ground state to the less trivial and more interesting quantum spin liquid ground state. This is what we do. And uh, the first thing that we can measure is the density of Rydberg excitations as a function of the final detuning. And what we see is that the, the density grows from zero up to this target one fourth filling where it sort of saturates or it slows down. So here is where we expect to see the spin liquid. How do we know if it is indeed a spin liquid or not? We need to measure specific types of correlations that uh, are measured by these topological string operators. And here I will try to just give a quick description of, of, of what we measure because I don't, I don't have enough time. But I will try to give you a, an intuitive explanation of what these things allow us to measure. So remember we said that the spin liquid should be these superposition of dimer coverings. So we want to verify two things. The first one is that we are indeed in this dimer phase. So the density is close to one fourth, but also we have the right type of correlations between the dimers. And second, that we are in this coherent state. So it's not enough to be in a dimer phase. We also want to see that it's a coherent superposition, which is the trickier things. So to, to measure these two things, we measure two uh, different string operators. The first one is this diagonal string operator called Z that basically measures the parity of dimers along a certain string. Basically, every time you the string cross a dimer, you get a minus one. And these uh, expectation values on this type of Z strings have a well-defined expectation value only if you are in a dimer phase. I won't go into details. But basically, the, the smoking gun to, to know that you are in a dimer phase is that the expectation value for this type of closed Z loops is finite, which is what you see in this plot. In the central range of the tunings, we find that the expectation values for all these Z strings is finite. And if you're interested in the details, we can talk about it later. The second thing that it's indeed even uh, more interesting is to check if we have coherence. And to, and to measure this, we need to introduce a second string operator that is of diagonal, we call it X. I won't define it because it would take too long. But the idea is that this X operator maps dimer coverings into other dimer coverings. And so it basically allows us to measure the coefficients of the superposition. Or to say it better, 
if we measure a positive expectation value for these closed X loops, we can conclude that we have more than one um, finite coefficients in, in, in this superposition. We have seven, now. let's put it better. So this is the smoking gun for the coherence. And again, uh, we measure X and we find that on a finite range of the tunings, we have positive expectation values. So putting these two things together, it looks like we are indeed preparing a state that is compatible with this picture that I gave you at the beginning, 10, okay? Uh, but as Marcello mentioned yesterday, there is a, a, a more precise order, these are all qualitative statements. There is a more precise order parameter that we want to measure. And this corresponds to basically comparing the expectation values on these string operators that you get on closed loops and open strings. And from these plots here, you see the measurements of Z and X over a broader range of the tunings for open and closed strings. And you can see that uh, the expectation values on open strings can be finite in some trivial neighboring phases, but there is the, the phase that we identified before as our dimer phase is the one where only the closed loops have finite expectation value and similarly for X. So the, 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 the long story short is that the closed loops are the ones that allow us to detect non-trivial topological correlations, whereas the open strings distinguish, allow us to distinguish the spin liquid from nearby trivial phases. And, the, and we, we can define an order parameter that puts this in, in, a, in a specific quantity, which are these Friedenhagen and Mark order parameters where you calculate the ratio between the expectation value on the open strings over the square root of the expectation value on a closed string. This basically allows you to see that the, you're observing non-trivial topological correlations normalized by the open strings. Anyway, the, the expectation from the theory is that in the spin liquid phase, both of these other parameters should be exactly zero, whereas in the nearby trivial phases, one of the two is finite. So we measured this and we find that there is a, a, a region of the tunings where both of these are zero while the, the closed loops are finite. So with this, we can identify that there is a, a, a range of parameters where we observe the onset of a quantum spin liquid phase. Now, as Marcello said yesterday, he has some doubts on the fact that this is actually a good order parameter. I think what we can say is that uh, these match pretty well with the numerical simulations where there are way more observables that you can uh, look at to check that this is a topological phase. So this is what makes us pretty confident, but um, I think it's interesting to see if there are more things that we can measure that are more, even more reliable than this. Uh, what I want to, the last thing that I want to mention on this experiment is that, uh, as I mentioned, this spin liquid phase can be used to create robust topological qubits. And so we did the first tests of this. If you want to create a topological qubit, you need an array with non-trivial topology, which means that you need to have at least a hole in the system. So we simply remove a few atoms from here, from the center. So we create this sort of flat donut shape. And when you do this, you basically create two distinct topological sectors for your uh, dimer coverings. And you can identify the two logical states of the topological qubits as the spin liquids that live in one or the other topological sector. You can then identify the proper logical op operators for this qubit, where sigma z is this z string that connects the hole to the boundary, whereas sigma x is this closed x loops, loop that goes around the hole. And in this case, we have a two-fold degenerate ground state uh, where the, the two ground states correspond to the uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric superpositions of the two logical states. What we can do in the experiment is just to repeat the same state preparation that I showed you before, but with this different array. And what we measure is that in the spin liquid region that we identified before, sigma z gives a zero expectation value, whereas sigma x has a positive expectation value, which means that we're preparing a state with a finite overlap with this plus state. So I went pretty quickly on this. Main uh, takeaway message is that we did the very first steps towards the realization of the topological qubit. 
of course, what would, will be even more interesting to do in the near future is to try and do some encoding and manipulation of this topological qubit. Can we apply these logical operators and do gates on single or multiple qubits? We have some idea on that. And one of the, of the most interesting thing that, I that I'm excited to try in the near future is to do some braiding experiments. So the idea would be to localize an anion and move it around and see that you have these anionic statistics. But other things that uh, are certainly interesting and that we're thinking about are how to do error correction on this topological phase. So we have a finite density of defects. Can we correct for that in a coherent way? So I think in summary, the, 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 the very nice thing that um, came out from this experiment is that we can really use this platform to explore photon and quantum information processing with these native uh, topological phases. Okay, let me quickly go to this uh, second experiment. This will be much quicker. But the general um, problem that we were considering here is how do you achieve non-local connectivity in your system? Four, okay. So, uh, many, in many platforms, the way you create entanglement uh, is based on some type of local interactions. And th that's the same thing in our case. We use these river blockades, so we have interactions between uh, nearby atoms. So how can you achieve no local connectivity? Uh, there are several approaches that have been uh, that have been proposed in different platforms. I will skip this, but this is the way we um, we decided to uh, answer this question in our system. As I mentioned before, we have these movable tweezers that we use in the beginning to rearrange the atoms into these different free arrays. But in this case, what we do is, let's imagine we put these two atoms close to each other and we can perform an entangling gate. I'm not telling you anything about how we do that. Just believe me, it's in this paper if you want to check it. So let's say we, we perform an entangling gate here. Then we can pick up one of the atoms and move it close to another one and then perform another entangling gate. And we can do a sequence of these moves. We can actually also move the atoms in parallel. And by doing sequence of gates, we can actually create this non-local connectivity and transport entanglement in a coherent way through the system. Now, there are a few, a few key ingredients to realize this. The first one is that the qubit that we want to use for this experiment is not the ground river qubit, the, the spin one half degree of freedom that I mentioned before. In this case, we use the, this hyperfine qubit so zero and one are encoded in two hyperfine states of rubidium, and we only excite to the Rydberg state for a, short for a short amount of time just to have interactions, perform the gates, and then we always map back to these zero and one states. The reason for that is that the hyperfine qubits has way longer coherence times, larger than one seconds. The atoms in these states are not interacting, so we can move them around without worrying about are they gonna um, interact with their neighbors or not. And as I said, we use these optical tweezers to do the movements, and we are hoping to uh, be able to transport entanglement uh, in a coherent way. And so the first thing we tested was the following. We prepared a few entangled pairs. So we create these bell state pairs, and then we separate the atoms in each pair by about 100 microns, and we measure the fidelity of the bell state pair before and after the movement. And what you can see from this plot where we measure the coherence of the pair is that the fidelity before and after is basically unchanged. So we concluded here that we can preserve coherence when we transport the atoms over 100 microns in just a few hundred microseconds, which is way shorter than the coherence times of the atom. So this was the first observation that excited us a lot because this means that we can uh, use this for a lot of different applications. Most of them are in, in a, to realize quantum computing architectures, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this, but there are also a lot of ideas to use this to have new probes for uh, many body phases and for the spin liquid phase too. But if you're interested, we can talk about this later. So one example that I want to show you uh, where we use this tool to realize some interesting uh, quantum computing architecture is this example where we realize a toric code state. I'm almost done. Um, the idea is you want to realize the historic code. What we do is we use 
a few ancilla atoms to mediate entanglement between uh, the, the data qubits in the, in the toric code. And so you have this central ancilla qubit that you move next to each of its four neighbors and you perform a sequence of four entangling gates to create all the right connections. And so in this movie, I'm gonna show you how the transport allows us to do that. We start with these eight pairs, we, we perform an entangling gate and then we start moving them and we perform, uh, I think, other four or five entangling gates. And then in the end, we separate these ancilla atoms from the rest to apply selective uh, rotations on the two groups. This is just a simple demonstration to show you how this uh, tool really allows us to do things that if you wanted to do the same thing without transport, it would be way more complicated and we would need to apply a, a much larger number of gates. So here I'm just showing you the measurement of the stabilizers and the, of the expectation values for the logical operators just to show you that we are indeed preparing the toric code. And this is the first realization of a quantum error correcting code in this platform that is really enabled by this highly parallel atom control that is allowed by the, the lasers. So, of course, what we would like to do next is to actually do mid-circuit readout to uh, realize logical state preservation and even more interesting to apply logical, to apply gates between these logical qubits. And finally, what we're hoping to do in the next, let's say, year is to apply algorithms with these uh, full tolerant logical states uh, with about 10 or so logical qubits. Uh, let me just skip this. Uh, these are the people that have been involved in these experiments. This is the experimental team up here. The three PIs that are involved here. And you see that we have a big group of theory collaborators. In particular, Ruben has been crucial for the spin liquid experiment. Um, and Dolev, who is here, was really the leader of this atom moving paper. Let me just quickly say that I'm gonna start my own group uh, in January, so if anybody's interesting, let me know. Uh, and finally, I want to thank you, and sorry I'm late. <laughs>